it was the first time I saw a sargassum frogfish in person. Um, and they're not actually all that uncommon in sargassum, but um, definitely uncommon on the stuff that's washed in. And I usually see sargassum that's been washed up on the beach, um, where there's virtually no chance of a sargassum frogfish being. Um, this was the first time, or well, the second time that I've been snorkeling in sargassum. Um, me and Sammy tried to snorkel in it off of Southlands, but we couldn't find anything. Um, we realized it was probably just because we were snorkeling in sargassum that um, was maybe dead, that had been washed out again, so it was really devoid of life. What is the Sargasso Sea? Uh, the two most important things to know are where it is and why the ecosystem is important. So, the Sargasso Sea is the only sea in the world without a land boundary. Instead, it's defined by rotating currents in the Atlantic Ocean, including the Gulf Stream and the Antilles Current. Um, so the boundaries kind of shift and change. Um, Bermuda is a landmass that's inside the Sargasso Sea, <laughs> um, and that's where I live. The Sargasso Sea is so important because it's a high seas ecosystem um, that supports a lot of very small creatures. So um, Sargassum is a type of floating macroalgae. Um, it never attaches to the bottom at any point in its life cycle. So a lot of algae does, but Sargassum does not. Um, it's designed to float on the surface of the ocean, and it just generates in the Sargasso Sea. When you think of the high seas, you might think of very large animals, like whales and dolphins and game fish, like tuna. Or you might think of it as an open sea desert. Uh, it's been characterized that way in the past. You know, just miles and miles of blue water with not a lot of life to be seen. Um, this can be contrasted heavily with coral reefs. That's an inshore ecosystem where 25% um, of all life in the ocean is found. So it's a big difference. Um, coral reefs, you can find lots of life, large biodiversity in a very small space, but the open sea uh, is a lot of area where you might not see any life at all. So why is the Sargasso Sea important? Well, the Sargassum can provide uh, a living matrix for very small animals to survive upon. Um, you don't think, this is what I find interesting, is you don't think of invertebrates and tiny animals as living in the high seas. You know, you think of blue whales uh, and rays or something, sharks. Um, but the Sargasso Sea intrigues me because it supports a huge number of invertebrates um, and it supports the early life stages of a lot of animals that grow up to be huge. Hundreds of fish species and invertebrate species depend on Sargassum um, either for their whole life or part of their life. Lots of game fish like Dolphin fish, tuna, rainbow runners, lots of billfish, they grow up uh, in Sargassum on the Sargasso Sea because Sargassum is the only cover that's present on the open sea um, in this area where there's just endless blue. Sargassum is also the place where uh, four of the seven species of marine turtle grow up. A lot of the hatchlings go from the nesting beach to the open sea and a lot of them end up in the Sargasso Sea where they grow up in Sargassum feeding on probably invertebrates and insects, stuff like that, um, and recent research has also shown that Sargassum creates its own kind of microclimate, so it's slightly warmer in the Sargassum and that helps the turtles grow up. Um, the Sargasso Sea is also uh, the only place where two species of anguillid eel are known to spawn. Uh, their eggs um, have never been found and spawning has never been observed, but we know that um, they spawn there because the Sargasso Sea is the place where we found the tiniest larvae of these eels. Um, so Sargassum is important for a lot of reasons. Um, another one is uh, carbon se sequestration. So the Sargasso Sea, it has high primary productivity, and when Sargassum sinks to the bottom of the ocean, it um, stores carbon there when it sinks. Um, it also supports a rich microbial community um, that sequesters carbon in a process known as the microbial loop. So what can you find on sargassum that's washed up on the beach? Well, the first thing to say is I definitely view sargassum in a different way than a lot of people do. Living in Bermuda, sargassum is not, um, it's not really a bad thing. We never get really inundated with sargassum in the same way that a lot of Caribbean nations do. Um, you know, sargassum, you know, sometimes it gets in the press as like, you know, really harmful algal bloom, like just inundating beaches, uh, ruining beaches, it kind of like dies inshore and then it sinks to the bottom and covers corals or seagrass beds and it causes all these issues. Like, 
It sometimes gets bad press for that, but I think it's really important to remember that where it belongs, sargassum is absolutely essential and so incredible. Um, so where it belongs on the high seas, it supports all these animals. Um, and when it washes ashore in Bermuda um, and in other places, uh, it carries these animals with them a lot of the time. The most common ones that I find are um, two species of shrimp. That's Latriodes fucorum and Hippolyte corolicens. I think that's how you say uh, the second one's name. But um, also Columbus crabs are super uh, common. That's Planus minutus. Um, there's also a Sargassum swimming crab, uh, but I've never found one, and I think they're probably more common uh, farther out. Sargassum nudibranchs are quite common. Um, I usually find a couple of those every time I go out. Um, and I've found some other nudibranchs as well, but those are less common. Uh, and the Sargassum frogfish is the coolest thing ever. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about each individual species. Um, you see lots of Columbus crabs when you're uh, finding sargassum on the beach. It's probably the most common thing, especially on South Shore. I see tons of them. Um, and they're called Columbus crabs because they were first recorded by Christopher Columbus um, when he uh, went through the Sargasso Sea. He was the first person to record it, but certainly not the first person to, you know, sail through there. And um, yeah, Columbus crabs are really cool because they uh, are super variable in color. So I've seen uh, ones that are you know, pale yellow, ones that are like deep orange, um, and or like pinkish, and then sometimes older ones have really intricate uh, deep brown patterns on them, um, which is super cool to see. Yeah, they also sometimes have like really prominent white patches on their cephalothorax. Like the first time I saw a Columbus crab, like I thought it had just like fallen down or like something had like stepped on it, and so it had this like white patch on the top um, from trauma or something, but it turns out that it's actually just like a camouflage strategy as well because like um, they're trying to mimic white tubes that are built by like calcareous worms um, on sargassum. For a lot of these animals, you know, camouflage is the number one priority um, and that's another thing that enchants me about them because I find that, you know, my human eye that's supposed to be uh, very intelligent and developed um, often loses these animals in the habitat that they're so well attuned to and so uh, developed and designed for. So the Sargassum nudibranch, um, nudibranch basically means naked lung and it's because these sea slugs are characterized by kind of wearing their lungs on their backs. Um, they have like serrata coming out of um, out of their bodies that kind of holds all these gill openings and for the Sargassum nudibranch they're so strange like they're very alien to us um, and even for a nudibranch they're very different because they have really prominent serrata coming out of their backs that try and mimic sargassum fronds and they overall just look very like wobbly and like um yeah i've been fooled a lot of times like i look at sargassum and i think like it just happened today like i thought oh i'm seeing the rhinophores of a of a sargassum nudibranch but it was just two sargassum fronds that looked really similar um, <laughs> to it so it's very very effective and yeah the rhinophores um on its head are sensory organs for sensing chemical changes in the water um, and then it has two other protrusions, which are the serrata, and in the middle it has this like fluffy gill membrane. Um, and the Sargassum nudibranch is actually capable of swimming uh, short distances, and it does this by like flexing its whole body. Um, when the Sargassum nudibranch is taken off of Sargassum, uh, they have no means of propulsion. They just have to flex their entire bodies, and they kind of flatten them out so that they're kind of doing a rudimentary type of swimming. Um, this is really not appropriate for long distances, so um, that's why so many of these guys are found washed up. Like, they have no means of um, really, like, trying to get to another sargassum mat. Instead, they just wash in um, because they're not very good at swimming. Yeah, and the shrimps, uh, the shrimps might be my favorite. I just love how active they are um, and how I feel like they have so much personality. Like, even though, um, yeah, they're some of the simplest of creatures, like, uh, Latriodes fucorum is the slender sargassum shrimp, and then Hippolyte corolucens is a more like bulbous looking shrimp. And I read this paper that was so interesting that was talking about how their camouflage strategies um, are different. So when given the choice, like the shrimps were given the choice between an all frond piece of sargassum or an all vesicle piece, um, and the vesicles are like the round like gas filled bladders that make it float, and the fronds are like leaves. leaves. Um, so 
the slender sargassum shrimp chose the all frond piece and hippolyte chose the all vesicle piece because the shrimp's bodies are attuned to those parts of the sargassum like to better camouflage with those parts of the sargassum um, and this is shown in the shrimp's behavior too and it's so cool to see it in action like when you see them actually moving around on sargassum like the slender uh, shrimp will attach to a frond, hold on to a frond, and a lot of times Hippolyte will attach to um, a vesicle, and it's because that's what their bodies are designed to camouflage against. Um, they're also super variable in color, and I think um, Hippolyte is just absolutely beautiful, like sometimes they're like cotton candy pink. Another cool thing th that this paper said was that um, when the shrimps are young, they attempt to mimic, you know, they, they mimic their plant part, and when they get older, they get too big to like convincingly do this. So like the shrimp doesn't look like a frond anymore because it's too big to pass as a frond. So they start to mimic the entire sargassum matrix. So their bodies get um, lots of patterns like orange, uh, they might have stripes on them. And they also get some blue dots, like definitely the slender sargassum shrimp does. Um, and the paper was saying this might be, you know, to mimic little, um, points of open ocean that are visible between all the sargassum when it's floating on the open sea, which I thought was super cool. Yeah, so the last one we'll talk about is the sargassum frogfish, and these guys are probably, you know, one of the most, like, charismatic symbols of the sargassum sea because they're a sargassum endemic, um, and they're just such a strange fish. So they have a pair of prehensile fins um, on the bottom so that they can crawl around on the sargassum mats. Um, and yeah, it's just totally adapted to the environment that it lives upon. Like, if you're living in this tangled sargassum weed, you don't really have to swim that much, probably. Um, and they also have an esca on their head, um, which is just like a lure that they use to, like, ambush their prey. Their camouflage is absolutely breathtaking. Like, they're just such strange fish, and <laughs> getting to see one in person today was really amazing. Like, they have really intricate patterning, but like, every fish is different. Like. That's what's interesting about pretty much all of the sargassum endemics, like, they're very variable in color. Um, so it's not a lot like, you know, reef fish where every fish pretty much looks the same, if they're at the same life stage. Um, yeah, and the sargassum fish has lots of, like, fleshy protrusions that make it look more like a piece of sargassum. Looking through sargassum, my journey started with um, the shrimp, just finding lots and lots of the shrimp at Tobacco Bay, and yeah, I just love how active they are, I love how they zip around. Um, and then, yeah, probably the second thing I found was the nudibranchs, um, and yeah, these guys are totally enchanting to me as well, like, they're just such an alien being, um, and they're really easy to see when you're looking through the sargassum because they look like gelatinous and they like writhe around a bit, like if it washes up on the beach you'll see them really easily. Um, the shrimp ping around too on the sand, they like jump. For the sargassum fish, um, you'll have to snorkel in offshore sargassum because they're more capable of swimming. And I've never seen a sargassum swimming crab either. Um, I would really love to see one because I think they're really beautiful, but I assume you would have to go farther offshore for those guys as well because, um, yeah, it's in the name, like, they're a type of swimming crab, they're designed to be able to swim quite long distances. The Planus minutus crab is probably, um, the one that you find the most because it's not really capable, it's not really designed to swim long distances, like, it's capable of doing it for short ones because it has broad legs, and I read a paper that said, like, they can swim for 45 minutes before they sink, um, which seems long to me, but they don't really tend to do it so that's why you find more of them washed up. Yeah, like I said, probably the most common thing. And it's sad because, you know, most of these animals unfortunately will die. Um, pretty much all of them will. I know that some of the shrimps can, like, get out of sargassum and survive in, like, seagrass and stuff. I think I read that in a book. But, um, yeah, the crabs are pretty much destined to die. A lot of the shrimps get washed up and just, you know, dry out. Or they're, um, become prey for shorebirds and crabs. And this is, you know, sad when you're getting to observe these animals, because on the one hand I'm very excited to see these new species, but on the other, um, I know that they've come so far inshore that they're probably not going to make it out again and be where they belong on the open sea, so yeah. But anyway, 
the counter to that is that they do support, you know, the shoreline ecosystem and, like I said, become prey for crabs and birds. So it's all kind of part of the larger ocean ecosystem. And I just feel immensely privileged to live here and be able to observe these incredible animals um, that have come, you know, thousands of miles. Like, they've grown up, their entire bodies and lifestyles are designed for the open sea, and they've come in and I get to handle them. I think it's amazing. <laughs>